Hello. Welcome to an ed another episode in our series here on learning and behavior. And in this particular episode, I'm going to talk about stimulus control. And uh, you might well ask, uh, what's the point of that? I thought we were all we were talking about stimulus control all along. That is in Pavlovian conditioning. What's stimulus control? Well, their the condition response is triggered by a conditioned stimulus, and this sort of condition stimulus controls the response. How about instrumental conditioning? Well, as we talked about in instrumental conditioning, uh, an instrumental response occurs in the presence of certain cues and is then followed by the reinforcer. But uh, the point of all uh, of this analysis is that when the subject is returned to the uh, stimuli in the presence of which uh, he was previously reinforced, those stimuli come to generate the behavior. That's essentially the law of effect. So uh, those stimuli are controlling instrumental responding. So uh, uh, what, uh, what more is there to talk about with respect to stimulus control? Well, what we're going to talk about today is uh, how uh, precisely uh, is the behavior dependent on uh, a particular dimension of the stimulus in the presence of which the behavior occurs. That is, we're going to talk about on the, the specificity of stimulus control. And to talk about the specificity of stimulus control, we have to uh, first, consider how do you go about measuring stimulus control? And you measure stimulus control with the use of what are called stimulus generalization gradients. And uh, three different examples of uh, stimulus generalization gradients are illustrated in the first slide. So even though this, these are listed as A, B, and C, let me talk about C first. Now, uh, these are hypothetical data to just illustrate the concepts. And in this, the concept we're focusing on here is how precisely is the behavior controlled by a particular color, okay, of a visual stimulus. So we present a visual stimulus that has a color. How important is the exact color that you present? Well, in order to determine that, you test the subject's behavior with a range of different colors. And here the range of different colors goes from red to yellow. And in curve C, the behavior pretty much stays the same regardless of those variations in color. So curve C, or generally a flat, a flat generalization gradient, uh, it represents very poor stimulus control by uh, the dimension that you're varying by color in this case. B is an inter intermediate example. Uh, there you get the most behavior with red, and as the color becomes more yellow, as the behavior drops off. Uh, A is even more precise in terms of what the exact color needs to be for the behavior to happen. So with A represents a, a very steep generalization gradient, and that represents the greatest level of stimulus control. All right, so uh, having introduced uh, this notion of uh, precision of stimulus control, what are the factors to determine how uh, uh, much your behavior is influenced by a particular color? And the next slide shows you a number of variables that are important. These are determinants of stimulus control. Sensory capacity is a big one. If you're colorblind, you're going to have trouble uh, adjusting your behavior as the color of the stimulus changes. If you're not looking at the at the visual cue, uh, you're not going to be influenced much by the color of the visual stimulus. Motivation is important. Uh, when we're hungry, we tend to look for at least uh, pigeons to. Uh, and their behavior is more controlled by visual cues. Whereas if they're in a fearful state, their behavior is more in uh, control by auditory cues. But by far and away, by far and away, the huge, hugely important factor that influences the degree of stimulus control is learning. And not just any old form of learning, 
but in particular discrimination training. So let's talk about what discrimination training is, and that's illustrated in the next slide. Now this uh, <clears throat> shows uh, responding, level of condition responding in the presence of two different stimuli. One is labeled S plus, and uh, that's the stimulus in the presence of which the behavior is reinforced, or in the case of a Pavlovian procedure, that's a stimulus that's paired with the US. The alternative stimulus, S minus, is a stimulus in the presence of which the behavior is not reinforced, or in the case of Pavlovian conditioning, the CS, uh, S minus is not followed uh, by the US. And so you, with this kind of discrimination training, you learn to respond in the presence of S plus, and you learn to with suppress your behavior in the presence of the S minus, and it's an active suppression. You notice that early during acquisition, if you start with a discrimination procedure early on, the subject res uh, uh, responds more and more, but he responds more and more to both the S plus and the S minus. But with continued non-reinforcement of the S minus, responding to the S minus drops out. And at the end, you get a huge uh, discrimination. So that's discrimination training. How does discrimination training influence stimulus control? The next experiment is one of my favorite, favorite experiments. And it really shows you the power of discrimination training. If we may go to the next slide, please. This was an experiment done uh, um, by uh, Herb Jenkins, a wonderful man and uh, associate uh, Harrison, man, pigeon pecking experiment. Uh, we got one more pigeon pecking experiment. You might be getting sick of these pigeon pecking experiments. <laughs> this one is spectacular. Okay, so group one, one group of pigeons didn't get discrimination training for them. Uh, uh, they were just re reinforced in a, uh, for pecking uh, in the presence of a, a 1,000 cycle per second tone, which was, which was present in the experimental chamber all the time. So it was part of the background. So this uh, 1,000 cycle per second tone is part of the background, uh, and pigeons were reinforced in a VI schedule. No discrimination training. Group two got discrimination training, but of a particular sort, in which, again, responding was reinforced when the thousand cycle per second tone came on, but periodically the tone was turned off. And when the tone was turned off, uh, there was no reinforcement for pecking. So uh, that's group two. Now, group three <laughs> is, uh, is, is, is a little more bit more complicated. Here, again, the S plus was a thousand cycle per second tone. So when that tone came on, re pecs were reinforced. But now when the tone changed a little to 950, so slightly lower pitch, all of a sudden reinforcement stopped. There is no more food for pecking. So they, uh, they got a different kind of discrimination procedure. Now, um, the thing to keep in mind uh, from the perspective of the law of effect is that the S plus or S in the, in the stimulus in the presence of which responses were reinforced was identical for all three groups. That thousand cycle per second tone was present for group one. It just was part of the background. There was this S plus for the other two groups. So different kinds of training. How, what's the impact of these different types of training? Well, <clears throat> to uh, <laughs> uh, break the suspense, <laughs> let's look at the next slide, which shows the results. And now there, these results are presented in a slightly kind of uh, different... Well, strange way. So there were the uh, during the testing, uh, the pigeons were tested with a wide range of different tonal frequencies, and uh, they looked at um, the total number of response across all those stimuli, and then uh, plotted the percentage 
of responses that occur to uh, uh, tones of particular frequencies. So let's start with the no discrimination training group. Okay, when they went, so for them, this thousand cycle per second tone was part of the background. And during testing, we're changing the pitch for different kinds of pitches down to 300 cycles per second and up to 3,500 cycles per second. Uh, the dashed lines, with the circles, indicate that across all of those different tonal frequencies, the pigeons responded about the same, about 10% of the total number of responses occurred to each of those test stimuli. Totally flat generalization gradient, no uh, control of pecking behavior by tonal frequency. Let's look at the next group that received discrimination training, but discrimination training of a rather crude sort in that the S plus was the presence of that thousand cycle per second tone, and the S minus was just you turned the tone off. So it's presence or absence of tone that uh, uh, distinguished the S plus from the S minus. That's the uh, open squares uh, and the smaller dots, and that established pretty good stimulus control in that the highest level of responding was to the thousand cycles per second tone and then behavior kind of dropped off as, as you increase the pitch, the frequency uh, pitch from there or decrease the pitch. And you got kind of a general bell-shaped uh, curve. But now look at the third group. These guys also got discrimination training. But for them, they had to learn to distinguish between a thousand cycles per second, which was reinforced, and 950 cycles per second, which was the S minus and non reinforced. Those are the data with the uh, dark uh, solid lines and, and uh, black squares. And <laughs> that shows incredibly precise stimulus control. Those guys were tremendously sensitive to variations in pitch. And they were sensitive to variations in pitch that went below a thousand cycles per second and variations in pitch that went above the uh, thousand cycles per second. So here is your answer. What determines how precisely behavior comes under the control of uh, detailed features of a stimulus, well, it's discrimination training. And the more exacting that discrimination training is, the steeper the generalization gradient and the more precise the stimulus control. So there's, there's some impressive pigeon data for you. And uh, what does this mean for you? in your daily life. You are not a pigeon. So what kind of conclusions can we uh, uh, arrive at from these kinds of results? Well, uh, the conclusion we come to is uh, discrimination training is really the basis for the development of expertise. And it's expertise in virtually any area of expertise. Uh, what those pigeons uh, learned is they become, became real experts in tonal frequency. And if you want to become an expert in something, you have to undergo discrimination training that's highly precise in the domain that you're gaining that expertise in. Uh, consider a professional decorator. <laughs> You know, I go into a Lowe's or Home Depot if I want to uh, repaint my room and I think, hey, I, I, I think I'd like uh, to repaint my walls uh, uh, a, a baby blue color, okay? So you go into a Home Depot, you go to the paint department, and you look for the baby blue paint. There is no baby blue paint. <laughs> and there are a dozen different versions of baby blue. I don't know how to distinguish between those. Uh, and uh, if you didn't show me all of them, but you showed me one color at a time and say, is this baby blue? Is this green? Is this purple? Uh, I'd call uh, baby blue a whole bunch of different colors. Well, they don't call them all <laughs> baby blue. Each color has, an, has its own name. <laughs> 
And one of the things I've been amazed at is how clever paint makers have become in coming up with names, you know, gray. There's no gray. There's one type of gray. And another. <laughs> There's wheat. Wheat is a color. <laughs> anyway, what those guys are experts in color. I'm not an expert in color. How, did, how does a professional decorator become an expert in color? Well, exactly the same way that Pigeon became an expert in tonal frequency. It's a special kind of discrimination training that forces your attention to these variations uh, that are seeming that they're very small variations in the nature of the stimulus. So the next time you think about stimulus control in pigeons, <laughs> think about how it's relevant to your own life as you gain expertise in judging gymnastics judging pieces of art, uh, decorating your home, uh, and uh, any area, judging different plays uh, on the chessboard, all kinds of areas of expertise all depend on this sort of stimulus control and discrimination training. So good luck to you the next time you try to pick out a color for your, to, to repaint your room. <laughs> I hope you have a better experience than I do. See you next time.